Welcome back. How we doing, everybody? Sorry, it took me a second to get all my stuff working. Because every so often, it just decides that it wants to stop working. Welcome back to the Funker 530 Live Show. I'm Ronnie, and I'll be your host once again. And I wouldn't mind if you just tapped on the like button. Just slap it right on the hind parts. It's an uppercut, a little bit of an uppercut. you got to lift. Uh, very important distinction from the straight from the straight slap. Lift up on the like button a little bit. And let me know in the chat where you guys are chiming in from. It's good to see you. Good to talk to you. Uh, listen. <laughs> Tonight's stream is going to be a little bit all over the place, all right? I'm prepping for a major project coming up in the next week or so, and, you know, I was able to pre prepare quite a bit for the stream tonight. I, look, I don't even have, I don't even have uh, my other, my other ear, headphone in. I, I'm, I'm all over the place today, guys. I did release our latest vlog, though. Uh, it's over on the vlog channel that, you know, we've been posting every so often to uh, the website. It's kind of my first foray into using some of the equipment that gets sent to us and a, a, a few more deeper thoughts on that. This one specifically was a Sightmark M-Spec Ultra Shot. Uh, I spent the entire time beating the ever-loving hell out of my rifle. And here's the trick to firearms ownership. Beat up your, your rifles every day and as often as possible, just in case if they do decide to do something on their own, they won't forget who the boss is. So do that a little bit every day, and I think you should should be just fine. Welcome back. How we doing? Uh, wake up, Buttercup. I'm here. I'm here. We're ready. We're ready. Let's turn the music back on because I love hyperdrive. Ozark, two miles outside Fort Rucker. Welcome in. Leeds, New Brunswick, Canada. I'll slap more than the like button there, big boy. Yuck. Don't mind the haircut. Don't mind the haircut. I gotta get it, I gotta get it cut again before we do that big project. And and for, most of you guys should be aware and tracking what that big project is because I announced it way too early and I don't think I was supposed to. Uh, so it's still happening. You know, I'm headed out there. Uh, I just want to remind everybody from a, a schedule perspective because we do try and update on the schedule for the live streams pretty regularly. We use the community feed for that. We use the comments section on both streams that I run. We talk a lot about it, but there's always somebody that's not going to be, that's not going to catch that. And that's okay. That's okay. You know, the Funker platform is relatively large and we have folks coming from all across it. Uh, I'm going to be away once again from the 11th through the 24th. It has changed a little bit. My my flight has changed a little bit. But for those of you that are tracking what that big project is, it's going to be pretty awesome, and we're really excited as a team about it. Uh, I'm hoping to be able to explain a little bit more about that once I get back. Uh, but for now, I'll just have to leave it as vague and random uh, as I just did. Houston, Texas, welcome in. Does North Korea launch a missile every time there's a function? <laughs> Did they launch another one? <laughs> I want to put a hat on because uh, my hair is kind of crazy. So we're going to wear the One Nation hat tonight. Check out One Nation Coffee. They're our sponsor and our partner. Uh, we're we're big time believers in the One Nation mission. They have a 501c3 in-house that every purchase of a bag of coffee uh, goes to their 501c3. They're also partnered with Folds of Honor. Most of you sh shouldn't know who Folds of Honor is. They have a special blend that they that they set up for them. OneNationCoffee.com. Go check them out. At least uh, maybe buy a bag or two to give it a shot. Give it a try. It's a family company that um, you know we're we're really proud to represent. Hey Ronnie from Weston. Welcome in Sydney, Ohio. Says hello. Hello, Sydney. Your birthday is the 11th. Well, happy early birthday, cue ball. All right, let's get started for the night. Uh, once again, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about Russia just taking stuff that isn't theirs. Imagine Russia on the playground. Where I grew up, bullies got their ass kicked. Taking stuff from people that didn't belong to them. Vladimir Putin decided to sign uh, essentially a, a piece of toilet paper that says that Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is now is now property of Russia. First of all, and for a little bit of context, most of you should be aware of this by now, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is the largest nuclear power plant in Russia, and it's one of the largest in the world, right? It's in the top 10 for the world. Over the course of the last, what's 72 plus 24? 
72 plus 24 hours, whatever math problem that you're, you guys can do that equation. I'm terrible at math. Over the last few days, a lot of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has been in the news. All right, let's wheel it back to October 1st. October 1st, Russia kidnapped the director general, the Ukrainian director general of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. They just rolled him up in his car while he was driving down the road and then eventually released him at Ukrainian lines on the 3rd. The day before, right, this is the day before they officially announced, or, or you know, within 48 hours, of officially announcing that just, that's mine now. So I also happened to write up my own agreement that the part of land that I would like from my neighbor where I can extend my home shooting range is now mine. I'm going to, I'm going to be writing that up. Uh, I won't necessarily send it to him, but I'm going to discuss that internally here with my family and, you know, maybe tell the news station. Uh, so hopefully he'll find out if he catches it on the news. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Now here is ultimately what Russia is doing. Russia is, you know, working to own as much energy as possible in Europe and Eastern Europe. They are essentially using that as a means to a hopeful end, to force capitulation for Ukraine. It, it, it is a very under-the-table way of doing that and goes along the same lines of the referendums and annexation. You know, again, I, I'm looking at this more objectively than it might sound. It's not yours. You don't just take it. Now, there's also reports that I can't substantiate of uh, Ukrainian workers that are being essentially forced to some degree or to, for some of these reports at gunpoint. Some is just really strong arming uh, to essentially not only support uh, Zaporizhia, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant being in Russian hands, but also continue to work and potentially bring that plant back online. The last two reactors were brought down in September because of continued issues with shelling in and around the plant. The IAEA was recently out there, and they've supposedly had people on ground. In fact, the director general of the International uh, Atomic Energy Association, I think IAEA, -I correct. The international, the director general of the International Atomic Energy Association was actually on his way to Kiev to discuss the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, and Russia kind of threw a curveball at him and just said, nah, it's mine now. You, can, you can't just take stuff like that. But here's the thing. Here's a, here's a direct quote from Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Vershenin. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. I've told you guys that before. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. He said, The Saporizhia nuclear power plant is now on the territory of Russian Federation and accordingly should be operated under the supervision of our relevant agencies. So effectively, Russia, not unlike the annexation and referend referendums, has said, well, that now that that is in Russian territory, according to, you know, what we say, it's now ours. I think that was one of the most pertinent pieces of news that I came across today. Do slap the like button in the hind parts forum, please and thank you. We, we do appreciate it, guys. Checking in on the support. Thank you guys very much for it. Uh, Stedman, thank you for the $5. I'll slap more than the like button. Don't make promises you can't keep. Okay. Uh, the B Knight Three, thanks for the five dollars. Appreciate that. Mock, thanks for renewing uh, your membership. Appreciate it. JJ, thank you for that two dollars. You see that Glock came out with his first rifle. I did, I did, and uh, I'm already gun poor, but I do intend to save up for that one because I'm a Glock. I'm a Glock fan. You know, I've got 1911s too. For some reason, anytime you talk about firearms, it turns into this 1911 versus Glock discussion. Like, as though those were the only two platforms. And then you get into the, the FUDs with the whole, you know, two world wars thing and their, their stupid green vests that they've always got on. Whatever. If Glock's making an AR, I want it. I want it real bad. Uh, Jason, thanks for the five months. Uh, bet they'll blow it up now. Oof. I got to check it out. Yeah, I, I'm excited about it. I am. You know, I'm an enthusiast. I like to shoot. I've been to some armorers classes. I'm not an expert. You know, I'm just more of an enthusiast kind of guy. You know, again, I, I started doing a little bit of, uh, you know, gun vlog type content. 
but more from just a, here's what I like to have fun with. In today's, I'm just, I threw my rifle across my range with a new optic on it to see if it would hold up. And, you know, hot tip, it did. Sight mark. Great work. I, I beat the ever-loving hell out of that thing, and it kept on ticking. I was actually talking to the Funker guys. I was like, when did this happen? They were like, never. Well, it happened now. Let's jump into our footage that we've got for the night. What do you guys think? Glock rifle uh, looks pretty well thought out. I, again, I'm excited about it. I uh, really like the ambi control. I'm not a fan of ambi controls. As a lefty, I'm not a fan of them. I've spent so long, you know, firing with right-handed controls that operating ambi controls feels weird to me. Let's jump into our footage here. We, once again, we've got it broken down between Ukrainian perspective footage and Russian perspective footage. We're going to play a little bit of uh, where'd that sound come from tonight. Uh, you know, a little bit of <laughs> reviewing some fake audio. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our Chechen friends, and we're going to see, uh, we're going to focus a lot on audio uh, towards about the middle of the stream once we get there. Uh, but the first one that I wanted to t take a look at was more footage coming out of Le Mans. Did I get it that time? I think I nailed it. I think I nailed that nailed that one. But more footage coming out of those counteroffensives that are happening in the east. I told you we're just going to call, start calling it the counteroffensives in the east. And then we're, once we look at this, we're going to look at a uh, up to date campaign map. Cremina will fall uh, sooner or later. Mark my words. Just from an objective point of view, it will fall. This video is coming up for you guys right now. No! Yeah! 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 Nice one! No, that's that was really good. All right, so what you're looking at here is uh, the International Legion just outside of Le Mans, Le Mans, Lemon. Le Mans. I'm going to keep saying Le Mans. Just outside of Le Mans, this footage is going to keep kind of rolling in. You know, what I haven't seen, we're seeing a lot of city-specific, you know, geolocations for the counteroffensives in the east. And we haven't seen a whole lot of that from the south. And when I say geolocation-specific, I mean, you know, something that it helps us understand exactly where that's happening. I don't know if, if from an OPSEC perspective, Ukraine is being more intent about, uh, you know, not disclosing where they are pushing in and around uh, Herson. But for the situation in the East, you know, just about every video we're coming across is this is Lamont, this is, you know, a city in between Lamont and Kermina, etc. Uh, we've got more International Legion footage coming up for you. Now, this one is uh, a little bit of a clincher. International Legion members, uh, you know, essentially in what would be considered a very, very close call with their demise. Uh, Russian artillery shell in, it ends up impacting just danger, danger close. Coming up for you guys right now. Don't worry, first time I watched it, I ducked too. Let's watch it again.
It's going to be a hard pass. Hard pass. I saw a comment come across. I hear American Voices playing today. It is the International Legion. So the International International Legion is where all of your foreign volunteers are essentially assigned. So you've got American, British, uh, pretty much anywhere that's not Ukraine. You've got Russians in there. you got Georgians in there. Amazing stuff. I would have sharded. Somebody definitely by that at that point would have pooped my pants. Yes, correct. Terrifying. Pucker factor of 10, yeah. Uh, TX Brent, uh, when you hear the whistle or the impact, though, those two things happen uh, so close together that even if you did start moving when you hear the incoming round, by the time you are moving, there is impact. Gladiators wearing their brown pants. All right, let's jump into the next one that we've got here. So we do have some Herson footage. Uh, Herson? Herson? Where's the emphasis on the syllable for that one? Uh, this is a tank assault. Uh, take note very specifically of the very soft ground. Um, that's going to be a factor that comes into play here very soon. If not already. Videos coming up for you guys now. Look at how deep that tank is starting to dig here. So one of the one of the challenges early on that Russia had to deal with that was, you know, displayed for everybody to see was the soft ground that essentially forced them into very narrow roads that created you know, funnels. Uh, you, that 40 kilometer some odd long convoy was ultimately a result of a poor piss poor planning, but B soft ground that their vehicles were having problems passing. So that soft ground is on its way back as we move towards the winter season. Uh, which is going to impact counteroffensives for uh, Ukraine as well as um, you know any counteroffensive from Russia. Uh, another another pucker factor video coming up for you guys here, and we're burning through the the videos that I wanted to talk about today. But we've got a Ukrainian Humvee taking a direct hit, and this is helmet cam footage. Might be a little bit disturbing. I don't know. Um, but this is one of those times that I would suggest adult diapers or brown pants. Coming up for you guys right now. Техника едет. Гул техники, блядь, с, на, с пивня. Гул техники с пивня. Всё. Слышишь? Отъезжаем! Отходим, парни, отходим. Сука, хуёво, а так посмотри, вот его обойдет. Впереди шесть еда. Еда там же. Давай, заднюю, 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 давай. В сторону, в сторону. No thanks. No thanks. We're gonna watch out. We're gonna watch out one more time. Here we go.
Впереди шесть еда. Еда там. Давай, заднюю, 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 давай. В сторону, в сторону. All right, so here's the deal. I want to break down. I want to break something down for you. Right before they get into the vehicle, and if you guys haven't seen the analysis that's been written up on five three zero for this, you would know this, or you wouldn't know this. You're gonna see our lead helmet cam guy point at something off in the distance. See him point out there? Now, obviously, that's where the shot ends up coming from. I, so I can tell you from personal experience that whatever hit this thing, these doors are extremely heavy. And this do this front door is hanging on by a thread. Just that thing's coming off if you spit on it. Okay. There are technics, he said. Is that what he said? Is that is that a translation? Maybe he's talking about technicals. Okay. Points at a technical, says there's a tank. Okay. Here's a technical. Yeah. All right. All right, let's jump into the next one. We've got an, a Russian SU-34. Getting shot down in... Somewhere in around Kharkiv. So we're in the we're back into the east again. What one of the things that I try to do as I'm prepping the stream that I just didn't have a chance to, I kind of alluded to earlier, is maybe separate things out from a from a location perspective. Like uh you know, when we fired the stream back up uh after me being gone for two weeks on Monday, I tried to break things down. Here's what we've got from uh the Hurston area, here's here's what we got from the east. You know, here's what we have on annexation and referendums. Uh, today, I did, just didn't have a whole lot of time to dedicate against separating things out like that as I, as I prepare for the next trip that we have coming up. Um, so we're bouncing around a little bit on the location. But this is somewhere in or around Kharkiv, and it's a Russian SU-34 being shut down. Copyright music, going to kill that. It means equipment in Ukrainian, Ronnie. Ah, okay. That's helpful. Thanks, man. I did not add, we, I did not add the, the text to this, you know, so take that all with a grain of salt. Coming up. And what, what that was alluding to is essentially what the hell was this SU-34 aiming at in the first place? We watched some video on Monday of an SU-34 dropping a bomb in a lake, or I don't know if it was an SU-34, Russian jet dropping a bomb into a lake, um, kind of feeding that. The, the, the pertinent part to that, though, to this video that I wanted that I that I wanted to make sure to hammer home is that the skies are still, you know, contested. To this day. This is how many how many months? Some of you guys are like tracking this by like hours. It's been X amount of hours. I saw that tweet earlier today. X amount of hours since Russia invaded Ukraine. I'm at, at this point it's you know just feels like years that we've been watching this happen. Um and I'm, I'm kind of losing track of the days. I can only imagine 
what people in Ukraine are dealing with right now. Right? This is a peer versus peer fight. It is. This is real footage, by the way. Correct. Correct. Play it again, please. Yeah, we can play it again. Here we go. Maybe we'll see a very strong winter offensive by the Russians. Doubtful. What's up, Enforcer Matt? It's good to see you, buddy. I see you out there. You're looking nice today. Did you put that on just for me? What GPU am I using? Uh, in this machine, I've got a 1080 Ti. All right, bringing it back up. What uh, what air defense doing? You guys, you guys remember? You guys remember the wacky, wavy air defense thing? I was telling, I was, you know, when I went on my trip to. Uh, uh, on orders, I was telling them about that video, and they didn't believe me that Russia would essentially burn their Mildek campaign on the inflatables. <laughs> uh, every every so often, I go back and just watch that one again. Uh, this one was an interesting one, and, and this is where we'll technically end our Ukrainian perspective footage. We've got a lot more Ukraine uh, footage coming up, but it's going to be mostly Russian perspective with a little bit of Ukraine perspective mixed in with a reason, and I'll explain that here in just a second. But this one was interesting because we've seen a lot about anti-drone guns, but what we're going to watch here is uh, an EDM-4S drone gun actually taking down a uh, Russian Mavic Pro. That video is coming up for you guys here in just a second. Here you go. I got copywritten music on the back end. Now, something of pertinence here is this seemingly ease that this happens, right? You have to understand how these drone guns are essentially going to work. What they're going to do is they're going to overload uh, whatever frequency it is that the drone is operating on. It almost looks like it could theoretically be staged, but let's talk about that for a second. Let me help you understand how 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 that would have worked is that drone gun would have effectively jammed the frequency or overloaded it with too much noise to where it couldn't communicate back with its operator and at that point what's going to happen is it's just going to it's it's just going to slowly lose connection and fall down like that oh you can't see it stand by Stage your training. I can understand. I can understand why you would, why watching this would lead you to believe that. But based on the way that system would work, this does make sense. Now, I obviously can't substantiate the fact of whether or not this is um, staged or otherwise, but it would make sense for that to essentially be how the drone would come out of the sky. I wouldn't hold that thing anywhere near my. <laughs> I wish I still had the commercials that I could cut away to or something. <laughs> oh, I got to check in on some of the support. Thanks. Thank you guys very much for Prometheus. Thanks for the $2. Do Humvees have a worse rep than they deserve? Probably. You know, it, it, one of those, one of those things. Uh, I hate Humvees because I've spent so much time in them. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're as bad. Now, they got a bad rap in, in Afghanistan because of the flat bottoms. That's where you started to, to see the mine-resistant, ambush-protected protect, and wrap the V-style hulls. Uh, essentially, that flat bottom of the Humvee would act as just a... It would just absorb 
the impact of IEDs. Uh, they're really boxy. You know, they suck. <laughs> but an up armored Humvee is better is better than nothing, to be honest with you. I, you know, I've got buddies that I deployed with early on in 2013. You know, we had up armored Humvees, we had MRAPs. Um, I did drive the majority of the missions that I drove in 2013 was in an up armored forerunner, though. I've got a bunch of pictures of that. That was wild. Thinking that you're going to be driving an MRAP and then you're given a forerunner. And it was stick shift and they had loaded this thing down with an extra 2,000 pounds worth of armor uh, with stock clutches. So you're burning the clutch up anyway. So, you know, I was there were some guys that I deployed with on my first deployment that were a part of the initial Iraq invasion. And they were rolling in in soft, in soft door Humvees, right? Uh, so up armored Humvees probably do get a little bit uh, more flack than they, than they should. It's better than nothing. You know what I mean? Better than no protection on the move. A cargo Humvee OP4. Yeah. Eagle Spurch, thanks for the $2. Did you look at Elon's tweet and had any thought? No, no, I didn't. I'm gonna be honest with you, man. Uh, I kind of, I, I, I wouldn't say that I flushed that. It did, it did resonate with me. It's just, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't care what Elon thinks. Um, you know, I, I like his cars, but you know, I try not to to focus too intently. I'm just giving you my my thoughts here. Focus too intently on uh, what he says and and have that impact. You know, me and mine. You know, now, you know, I say that and it's kind of, um, it's kind of difficult to say that because of the level of a platform that an individual like that has, right? Um, he's just not someone that I am wrapped around on what he is saying. Uh, Dennis, thanks for the 20. Keep up the great work. I'm hoping the Russian, uh, Russia gives up peacefully without the mushroom clouds. Yeah, so so we haven't talked a whole lot. Uh, we'll we'll take a pause here before we jump into our Russia perspective footage, and we'll talk a little bit about my thoughts on, uh, which is entirely based upon z absolutely zero expertise. Uh, again, I don't pretend to be a Ukraine expert. I don't pretend to be a Russia expert. It, in fact, my entire the entirety of the time that I spent as an intelligence analyst, uh, information and information operations was focused very intently on counterterror. Uh, and an insurgency. You know, the closest ties that we had to Russia were the small arms weapon systems that they were using. But relative to, to nuclear weapons, that, that, that word gets thrown around quite, quite a bit. And I don't think we've ever really been closer, you know, since at least the Cuban Missile Crisis. But that word still gets thrown around quite a bit. And, you know, people use a kind of blanket... Vladimir Putin is uh, off his rocker. He'll do just about anything. I, I tend to disagree, right? Uh, I do think he's out of his mind. You know, he absolutely has no right to be in Ukraine right now. Uh, but the things that he is trying to do are calculated. Uh, in, in practice or on paper, they are calculated. Theoretically, they are the things that he would do if he were trying to achieve the things he wanted to achieve. Right. Mobilizations. Things aren't going well. I need additional combat resources on the ground. Mobilization is not working the way he expected that to work. Uh, they are absolutely not combat effective troops. Uh, I mentioned this on Monday, and it's callous to say it this way. But all he has really done by doing that is make Ukraine a target-rich environment for Ukrainians. When it comes to, to nuclear weapons, even... There are a, a couple reasons that I think that we are much further away from that kind of activity happening than, than people think. Largely because I think right now he is overly reliant on uh, essentially a pause. So what, what, what Russia needs to happen is uh, a pause of offensive movement in any direction after the referendums. He, he needs... Ukraine to realize that uh, if they continue to take ground, if he, it, you know, understanding if he were to use nuclear weapons, he needs to continue. He needs to realize that if Ukraine were continue to, were to continue to take ground, that what would end up happening is you know catas catastrophic loss. Well, there are a couple things that he's trying to do ahead of that, like control the nu the energy 
for the entirety of Europe. So if he holds the entirety of Europe hostage from an energy perspective, and Europe is not able to weather the winter without energy, he has effectively forced Ukraine further towards the capitulation table. His mobilization is supposed to do one of those things as well. It, I shouldn't say one of those things. It's supposed to drive further towards uh, a capitulation by pausing or, or fixing Ukraine in the current state. Say Vladimir Putin does come to the conclusion that it is time for him to use nuclear weapons, right? So he's got two, two cards in, in his hand that he is playing right now before we start to walk down that potential nuclear weapon track. But say he does, it is highly unlikely that he will end up using that on population centers. And here's why. If he uses a nuclear weapon, he knows that there will be some type of commensurate um, response from NATO. Biden and NATO will have to respond in that case. They have already said that they would. So at that point, Putin is going to have to make an active attempt at mitigating the risk associated with that. So it's more likely that he's going to use that uh, in an open field or you know somewhere that, uh, you know, catastrophic loss, catastrophic non-combatant loss is going to be low. That way, NATO's response will be commensurate with that loss. I don't believe Putin is as, you know, crazy and mad and off of his rocker as, as a lot of people think. I think he's a pretty stupid-ass dude for doing what he's doing. Again, I'm speaking to my personal, I'm opening up to you guys a little bit on this. This isn't something I prepared to talk about tonight. It's just is my personal thought process. I don't, I don't think he's just bet, as batshit crazy as people think. I think he is try, doing his best to think rationally after an irrational action of invading Ukraine. You know, how can I, how can I move um, to kind of bring this to an end? Because the longer that he delays this, and we're getting way off target of what we normally cover, this is not like Ronnie's thoughts. This is supposed to be, this is supposed to be combat footage show. The longer that he delays this, the more and more the power balance of the world shifts and Russia no longer has that boogeyman kind of card to play, right? I grew up with Russia being the boogeyman, that Russia was the equivalent of the United States. I can tell you that that's not the case, right? Well, you know, we, we've been watching this footage. We've seen what happens. You know, I... I have spent the last 16 years of my life in the United States military. That's that's absolutely not even close. Not based on what we see. I, I need to move on. You know, I'm, I'm diving down too many, you know, thought process rabbit holes and my ADHD is not going to let me stay on target here. We would take, all their, take out all their nuke silos. Um, drone footage is staged. Yeah, maybe. Great video of Russian soldiers in love. Got a happy ending from a Ukrainian... <laughs> I linked you guys that one. I didn't show it on the stream, but I linked it to you. Mm, USA got beat by the Taliban. No, they didn't. You, the Taliban beat our foreign policy. You go to any veteran of the United States, go to any element at any level, go to a squad-sized element, go to a team-sized element, go to a regiment, a company, uh, whatever you want. Any engagement, the force, the soldier versus the Taliban, the, the sailor, the airman, the Marine versus the Taliban did not lose. We lost because of strategic leadership follies, top to bottom. That is, that is ultimately where the United States failed. It has nothing to do with the warfighter. Absolutely nothing. Go to go to go to any one of them, right? He's drawing them in. That's what it is. Who's drawing who in? Coin was too late. It was. Yeah. Yep. I had soft doors and Humvees and used sandbags on the floor. That's that's gangster stuff, man. That's gangster stuff. Let's jump into uh, this, this Russian perspective set of footage that I've got here. So 
So this one's interesting. This is a Russian MiG-31 crashing during takeoff in Crimea. Now, in, in just as many weeks or months, inside of a month now, I don't know if these both happen at the same time or in that span of time, but I've seen two videos from at least the past few months of Russian jets crashing after takeoff. Let's, let's wheel back for a second and talk about what I just said. So one of the things that I just mentioned is that the United States military versus the Russian military is just not the same comparison. It's just really not, right? But not even close. Do Russian jet or do, do American jets crash on takeoff? Yeah, it's happened before. Has it happened in secession like this? I don't know. I haven't researched that. Here we go. Copyrighted music. And there it goes. Wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's the flares. Eagle Spritz, thanks for the 10, buddy. I'm going to bring this up while this video is closing out. Uh, do you see task and purpose video on Turkey? Do you think Turkey should be removed from NATO? I think as long as uh, Erdogan's in power and he partner panders to China and Russia, then Turkey should. Thoughts? It's kind of a $20 problem on a $5 budget, man. That's not something... No, I did not see that video. Um and I don't know that that's something that I'm smart enough on to really speak to. Uh, but looking at that at face value, right, just based on that based on that one liner. No, not necessarily. Pandering, pandering is one thing, right? You know, setting up some form of alliance, arms trade, um, you know, that would be something different. And I haven't had the time to really research that. Like I've mentioned before, covering Ukraine and covering this level of topic, you know, I'm, I'm starting to learn a whole lot more while doing it, but I won't pretend to to have knowledge on, you know, things that are above my pay grade, if you will. Uh, I, I try not to speak to things that I just have no idea about. I do have opinions on it. Um, and I think NATO is emboldened by having a, kind of a, what, what's the term? Not red herring, you know the 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 one of your family that's like the the weird guy, you know the shunned one. I think it's good to always have a red team, right? To always have a dissenting opinion or somebody that can potentially see things from the other side. That's a very oversimplified way of looking at that, uh, but it's without any true or strong understanding of that at a deeper level. You know, and I wish I had more insight for you. Yeah, personally, I wish. Mm. Just checking back in on the chat here. Black sheep. That's what it is. Black sheep. Yep. All right, we're going to watch the two luckiest Russians you'll ever see. Coming up for you guys now. No, the black sheep of the family. That's what I'm thinking of. So this is going to start off like just about every other piece of combat footage that's coming out of Ukraine at this point. Uh, drone footage. You know, if you guys haven't noticed, I stopped. I stopped showing. You know, drone drops mortar on this guy or that that person because from a combat footage perspective, yes, we're tracking the TTP, uh, but this one's pertinent because sometimes that tactic fails.
No worky. One more time. You know, that has to absolutely be terrifying. Will we see, thanks for the 999, I remember Jeep. Uh, will we see an effective Russian counteroffensive, uh, a Russian offensive soon to counter the Ukrainian gains? It seems like Russia is losing a lot of ground, only sit there and do nothing. I, th I think we see the early attempts of something like that happening to... Uh, essentially, again, fix Ukraine in the positions that at least they are before they take too much of Luhansk or Donetsk, uh, Zaporizhia uh, or Kherson back. The problem and challenge for Putin, uh, again, Putin is making a lot more of these calls at a very low level. So in my mind, in, for Putin, in, whom is so far disconnected from the individual mobilization efforts, in his, you know, in Putin's mind, he's got an additional 1.2 million, uh, 300,000, which was announced, that he is going to apply against uh, solidifying his you know, defensive forward line. The reality behind that is, you know, effectively, Russia has lost a lot of what it has, you know, uh, kind of, you know, penciled in as its special military operation. They have lost a lot of that organized combat power. It was very effective early on. We saw how fast Russia took ground, you know, starting February 24th, the, the taking of Ostomel Airport, uh, the eventual failing of that. That's a whole different discussion, you know, whether or not to call that a failure, uh, because eventually they did take it. They just took a lot of casualties in it. But they took a lot of ground early on, but they started really taking extremely heavy casualties. And because of that, what they have had to do is reshuffle their uh, the way their units um, are aligned. So what you have is these hodgepodge units that are now essentially trying to dig in and you know build fortifications and just hold ground. So in in Putin's mind, I'd imagine that the uh, aligning of an additional three hundred thousand to one point two million, whatever it is now, is the start of potentially taking ground back. But the ground that Russia has lost so far, most of it, the majority of it, is not in the areas where they announced referendums, right, or annexation. So the majority of the ground that they lost is like Kherson Oblast, or excuse me, Kharkiv Oblast, right? Well, they care more about Donetsk than they do about the ground that they lost there. So from a, from a, recon, from a consolidation perspective, it seems like they're already trying to do that. There isn't a whole lot of ground that they really have to reclaim as long as they can shore up def their, de their defensive forward line and retain the ground that they have. Push too far too fast and destroy their combat power. Exactly. Yeah, that's just a, a, a much more simplified and astute way of saying what I was trying to. Yeah, please use English in the chat. If you can't tell, I'm 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 too stupid as it is to understand, you know, my own language, which is English. So imagine me trying to understand your language, right? So if you would like to insult, please do so in English. That way I can read it. They took undefended ground. Yeah, you're not wrong, right? Uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people looked at that and kind of chalked up the, a, a major win, and I, I can understand that. What I what I essentially just said there did the same, but um, what they needed to do was kind of solidify that ground. Uh, it, I, again, I still maintain that they pushed too hard, too fast, with too many fronts that they couldn't supply. Right, the 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 Russian logistics train was absolutely exposed here. Right, everything from food to fuel, which we've got video for. So so the other the thing to understand about my about my understanding of the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is it's very rooted in the video that we find, right? 
so we've got footage from early on with you know Russian troops looting gas stations, passing out drunken gas stations, Russian ships asking Georgian ships for fuel. From a logistics perspective, their their capability to supply their troops was absolutely exposed here, right? Ronnie, the length of your shorts are way too long. Dude, I'm sweating right now because I'm wearing pants. Like, I've got pants on at the moment, and I'm sweating. I forgot to turn the fan on. My day has just been all sideways. One thing to note about this stream, there, there, might, be, there might be folks chiming in that are new. They're like, what the hell are we watching? This isn't designed to be some kind of a news show. This is a way for our community, the Funker, the, the Funker 530 community, to connect. Right? I'm not, a, I'm not a Russia expert. I'm not a Ukraine expert. Right, uh, that that that's not what we do. We do we do combat footage, right? So what, when we go live Monday, Wednesday, Friday, at six o'clock, we bring up some of the latest footage that we saw. If you'd like to see other footage, you go check out funker 530com That's our primary primary platform. That's where we post ninety some odd percent, all you know, ninety eight percent of metrics on the internet are bullshit. That's where we post an overwhelming majority of the stuff that we find. This is really only going to be bits and pieces of it. But this is designed for us to connect, to talk. That's why I you know, spend so much time hanging out in the chat. And I understand that we call it FNN. I still don't know why we call it the Funker News Network because we, we don't do news, right? It's just not what we do. We're not, I'm not a news anchor. I'm just a dude, I'm just a dude in his, uh, you know, on the second floor of his house that you know, spends his days watching combat footage. All right, let's jump into the next one here. We're I'm spending too much time running my mouth. So, uh, Russian perspective footage here. You know, I realize that we that we watch a lot of footage that, you know, might not paint Russia in the best light, but we're about to, right? the The intent is never to you know be one sided. It's to be as objective as possible. Personally, I don't have anything against the population of Russia, right? I don't have anything necessarily. At a, at a very overarching level against the Russian military. They've never, never done anything to me. What they're doing to people in Ukraine is absolute bullshit, though. People need to understand and they need to see that. right? But what we're about to watch is the, is the Russian military's best infantry fighting vehicle team. We're, we're about to watch Russian badassery here. I'm, I'm, not, even, I'm not even sugarcoating that. I'm not, I'm not being funny. I'm being serious. What you're going to see is you're going to see an infantry fighting vehicle that's been essentially disabled and its crew is still under fire. And then in comes their savior. Hey.
All right, bringing it up. So again, guys, understand that as individuals, we have our biases. I have my own, right? From a, from a platform perspective, though, uh, we show perspectives from Russia, from Ukraine. And I, I could tell you, though, that we post the stuff that we find. So if it, if it looks like we're showing a whole lot of Ukraine perspective footage, that's what we're finding, right? There's more Russian perspective footage that's out there, but for the longest time, it was nothing but Ministry of Defense watered down releases of K-52 footage, uh, you know, just doing that high angle attack thing. Then they launch rockets off and then they go and land again. Driver was a badass. Yeah. Yeah. You call, you call it like it is, guys. You got to call it like it is. All them potholes. A little surprised to be Russian army going back for him, to be honest. You know, I, I've seen that narrative a few times. And, and I, I mean, maybe across across the entirety of the Russian army, that might be a problem. But at the individual level, they're just people, you know. Um, there's a lot of war crimes. There's a lot of atrocities that are happening right now. So those all that also needs to be taken into into account when I say something like they're just people, and I'm I'm, I'm talking a little bit more and and kind of opening up a, a few more of my head, the way my head works to you guys than normal. But I mean, <laughs> they're chopping people's balls off too, right? You got to hold that. You got to you got to keep that in context. I watched that video. No, we didn't post it. There's no combat footage. There's no footage value to that. Right? We are combat footage documentarians. Again, we don't do news. Right? We might talk about current events and we might talk about things that are happening you know, to provide a little bit of context to what we're seeing. But I watched that video and it was extremely difficult to watch. Uh, I, I wish I hadn't. All right, jump into the next one I've got here. All right, we're going to play, um, we're going to play a game. The game is called Find me where this audio comes from because it doesn't come from whatever it is this person is trying to tell me that it came from. Listen very intently. I'm going to crank this all the way up. Earphone or headphone warning, ear warning. You've been warned. This is going to be very loud. But listen. Listen and tell me if the sounds match what's happening in the video. <laughs> Hold on a second. Stand by. We're going to do a little bit of investigative journalism here. One sec. Give me a sec. Give me a sec. Coming back up. Coming back up. Enhance. Enhance. Interesting. 
All right. Yeah, that audio is fake, man. That's, that audio is fake. See, that's what I'm talking about, though. This is the kind of shit that the stuff. God, I'm making bad words. Beep, 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 beep. This is the kind of stuff that we find, though, right? And just about everything that's coming from these Kadrovites, the Chechens, is just absolute nonsense. I could type in Chechen in all of the footage that we found and might find one piece of genuine combat footage. Honestly, like it's... Anyway, got the drum mag. Does the the uh, the Magpul drum mags, though. The Magpul ones aren't bad. Uh, there's another brand that I don't remember or not another brand that I don't remember what it's called that just jam up like nobody's business. Now, we just listened to that audio. I'd like to play you some... I'd like you to focus intently on another set of audio here. This is Ukraine perspective footage. And this one's this one's going to be a little bit in anxiety. Uh, it's going to going to raise your blood blood pressure a little bit. Close your eyes on this one. Coming up for you guys here in just a minute. I got to give props to Josh on the the Admiral General Aldine reference there. That's props to Josh. So there's a there's a pertinent reason that we showed Ukraine footage or Ukraine perspective footage in our Russian perspective footage. So think back to our Chechen video that we just watched. You at the at the tail end of that, you just heard all hell break loose. I remember there was uh, my first deployment. Right. We were um, we were all sitting inside our little uh, work area that we had. And our OIC comes to us and was like, hey, I was just outside. And, you know, there's like a there's like a bunch of firecrackers going on. And I'm looking around with my buddies and we're like, why the hell would there be firecrackers or fireworks going on? Right? All hell was absolutely breaking loose outside of our, um, outside of Camp Eggers, inside of Kabul. That's what it should have sounded like. 
right? We could hear everything from rockets coming in there. We could hear incoming rounds. Why in the hell the Chechens decided to add all of that extra video game stuff? I play video games. I do. I'm going to be playing Hell Let Loose tonight once we get done with the stream. Why they decided to add all that extra stuff, I, I just don't know. I have no idea. All right, next one coming up. Uh, let's watch some Chechens again. Uh, this time, what we're going to see is uh, Chechens being or receiving con indirect from Ukrainian uh, mortars. Here you go. Copyright music. All right, coming back up. Check it in on the chat over here, or on the uh, support that's come across. Uh, B Knight 3, individual Chechen arm amputation. You see a Hamas fighter. Any, have you seen any more signs or activity of, of Hamas in Ukraine? No, not necessarily. Uh, I can tell you that just, you know, from. Uh, talking about two generally separated areas here. I can tell you that Russia, there there was a lot of reporting earlier on of Russia working to um, bring in Syrian fighters. Um, Hamas being called out specifically, I don't think so. Um, but I don't know that I have seen the video specifically that you're speaking to. So it, here's the deal. When you guys find footage... Right, we're our team is six people total. Uh, right, we are, and we each have separate functions of Funker Five Three Zero. My functions at Funker Five Three Zero are working with our industry partners, uh, as well as doing all of our forward-facing content, so our edited videos, our live stream, which you guys are familiar with. You've got Josh and Will. Uh, Josh and Will are our bloggers and writers. They each have been doing this for a, a, a really long time. Uh, Timo. Tim helps me a little bit on uh, the uh, industry partners side of the house. He also is dad. So anytime we're doing something stupid, he lets us know and we tell him to go sit in the corner and don't worry about it. Um, and then we have Austi and we have Cody. So Austi uh, is also one of our writers and bloggers. He's you know working a little bit on family stuff right now. So you ha probably haven't seen a whole lot from Austi lately. And then we've got Cody, Cody McGee Shoots on Instagram, former ranger. Um, he is our video editor and uh, essentially all around smart guy when it comes to anything production related. So the reason I say that is when you guys come across footage, we are not, you know, a very large team. Send it in to us, you know, funker530.com slash submit. You guys are welcome to send it in to us. We'll take a look at it. If it's something that we're already tracking or we have scheduled to post, you know, we appreciate you sending it in. If not, that's how we can get you involved in the types of footage that we include on Funker 530. Here are the kinds of things that we're not going to show, right? Because there is a compass. 
Again, our intent is to show combat footage, not be a gore site. We're not, we don't intend on taking the same path that Live League did. We're not going to show dead people for no purpose, right? If there is purpose and intent behind that from a combat footage perspective, we'll show it. There are, there are some nasty things that you'll come across on Funker 530 that you're not going to find elsewhere. But there's context with those things. We showed some footage from Bucha, right? We've got footage of artillery strikes from the Syrian regime on white helmets. We've got, our, we've got footage from you know, the global war on terror that shows some pretty nasty things. It's the context about it. If it's just video of dead people, that's not something that we're interested in, in posting. So you guys can get involved in the things that we post as well. Use the submission form. We're happy to take a look at it. All right, so that is, uh, actually, let me check the homepage and see if there's anything that we've posted since. Uh, yes. Yep. This one, currently the featured video that we have, uh, we've got uh, Ukrainians exposed on the roof of uh, some form of armor, and they are essentially, you know, the luckiest men on the planet. So we watched the luckiest uh, Russians ever. We're going to watch the luckiest Ukrainians ever. And then we got one more bit of footage that I want to jump into. We're going to talk a little bit about law enforcement tonight. Just some different stuff that we cover. Here you go. All right, we'll bring it back up. If you guys would like uh, to head over there and watch that again, that one was pretty wild. That's currently the featured video on Funker 530. There's the link for it. Uh, I got one more bit of footage that I wanted to take a look at here. This is going to be some law enforcement footage. It is going to be you know, somewhat difficult to watch. Uh, but what we have is essentially excessive use of force caught on camera. I'm going to let you guys watch it, and then we'll bring it back. I'll check in on the chat, and we'll talk about it. Coming up for you guys here in just a moment. It's only two minutes long, but it's important to watch. With Chuck Trapani with the Mesa Police Department. On July 2nd, 2022, at about 1.45 a.m., a Mesa police officer conducted a traffic stop in the area of Country Club Drive and Ivy Glen in Mesa. The officer had observed the silver Hyundai Sonata swerving in the roadway. The vehicle stopped in the area of 450 West Ivy Glen. Shortly after initiating the traffic stop, the officer requested a backup officer to respond to assist. Here's the initial radio transmission from the Mesa police officer conducting the traffic stop. I'm David, 465 West Ivy Glen, and I'll take an arrow six. Okay. After the vehicle stopped, the officer approached the car. Once the backup officer arrived on scene, the officer conducting the traffic stop opened the driver's side door of the vehicle asks the driver to remove his seatbelt and exit the vehicle. At this time, the driver tells the officer, come on, man, and then accelerates and drives away westbound on Ivy Glen with the driver's side door still open. As the vehicle drives away, the officer fires two rounds from his duty weapon in the direction of the fleeing car. During the investigation, it was learned that the driver fled to an address on the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian community. The Mesa police helicopter observed the vehicle at a residence there a short time after the shooting occurred. Due to jurisdictional challenges, Mesa police officers were unable to enter the Indian community to contact the driver. Through the course of the investigation, detectives were able to identify the driver and contacted the 18-year-old male via telephone. The driver advised detectives that he was not injured and his vehicle was struck by two bullets. 
The driver declined to return to the city of Mesa to speak with detectives further, but did provide a photograph of the damage to his vehicle. At this point in the investigation, we know that one officer shot two rounds from his duty weapon. This officer has been with the department for four years. This is his first officer-involved shooting. This investigation is ongoing. Upon completion of the investigation, criminal charging will be reviewed. As with all officer-involved shooting investigations, all the information and evidence in this case will be presented to the Maricopa County Attorney's Office for review. Thank you for taking the time to watch this critical incident community briefing. All right, let's talk about that for a second. I've been I've been watching watching the chat. Here's the deal. Generally speaking, you know, we are 100% in support of our law enforcement. They're doing a job that, you know, is extremely difficult every day, and they get a lot of backlash for it. But here, here, I am not a law enforcement officer. I am I am I like to believe that I'm just a reasonable human being living in the same country that this incident just happened. This, this officer resigned because of what happened. Now, I'm not sure how the justice system works, but uh, it's likely that he'll potentially be prosecuted here. What went through his brain there, I'm not sure why he felt the need to, to take a shot. I, I can't put, put myself in his shoes. But I can tell you that as a civilian, as somebody that I like to believe, again, this is objective, or this is subjective to how I feel. I, I believe I'm a reasonable human being. I can't resign as a civilian if I would have decided to draw my firearm in that instance and fire two rounds at an 18-year-old because he drove away. There's two sides to every coin. Okay. What was he shooting at? Uh, so let, let's let's... Let's back up and let's talk a little bit further about what exactly we just watched. So, that car was pulled over because it swerved. The officer, essentially under suspicion uh, in some way of, uh, or likely had something to do with it swerving, under suspicion of drunk driving, asked for him to exit his vehicle. The 18-year-old chose not to do that and drove away. Upon that 18-year-old driving away, officer drew and fired two, fired two shots at the vehicle. Ex absolutely an excessive use of force. I, you don't need to be a police officer to be able to say that. You know, there are, you, a, a lot of times it's important to wait for context, to wait for the facts, right, to better understand the situation surrounding it. But there isn't a whole lot is f from what information is available right now. This happened in July. That would have justified him doing that. In my opinion, police are always supposed to be the best of us, right? Uh, and that's not always the case. At Funker 530, we post this stuff for both sides of that coin. It's important to see the difficult job that law enforcement does so that people can understand the challenges that they deal with. But it's also important for people to see that our law enforcement's not perfect, right? That there is potentially a need for better training for law enforcement, for training under duress and stress. I can't, I can't say one way or another, I'm not a cop. I'm not, guys. But as a reasonable human being, as somebody that is just watching this video, absolutely no reason for that. Right? If either of those rounds would have struck that 18-year-old, he would have had to live with that for the rest of his life. And the, the simple fact that he took those two shots needs to answer for it. Law enforcement considers this as contempt of cop, zero risk due to the flight of the vehicle. Just following following along with the chat here. Uh, I want to check in on all the support that's been coming across. Impossible is just an opinion. Thank you for the two dollars. I uh, love the app. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. We work we work really hard on making sure the app is you know up to date. That bugs are fixed. It's not perfect, but again, there's there's six people behind it. Right? We're not some media conglomerate that's trying to you know steal your data or your information. We're trying to consolidate all of this footage so that you can come to your own conclusions on this stuff. Right. The, the things that we talk about here are really just my conclusions. 
And, and oftentimes it's going to be to some extent at face value, just based on footage. Footage is a 2D representation of something that happened in a 3D space and we'll only ever be able to glean from it what we can from what's on the video. You know, we can do research to try and add a little bit of context to that. But in just like in the instance in Mesa, I don't have all of the context that was there. Maybe the officer, you know, had other information that I did. But bringing it back to this, no reason for that. As a reasonable human being, absolutely not. You can have my data, Ronnie. You stop it. Uh, Tim, thank you for the $9.80. TikTok Italian just celebrating their newly promoted Colonel General Don Don. <laughs> Admiral General. Admiral General. I'm out of here. I'm going to be playing a little bit of Hell Let Loose over on the other side tonight. I hope you guys will swing by and join me. It's going to automatically redirect you over there. All you got to do is click on yes. I do want to go watch Ronnie be a dumbass somewhere else, not just here at Funker 530. I appreciate you. And we'll see you guys Friday night at 6 o'clock right here for a little bit more of totally not news on the Funker News Network. Good night. Stay informed.